Good morning, everyone. I extend a very warm welcome as Secretary General of India Energy Forum to all panelists, members, and delegates to this webinar. It's an honor to welcome Mr. Pankaj Agarwal, Secretary Ministry of Power, as keynote speaker. Mr. B. S. Sharma, B. N. Sharma ji, Chairman RERC, will discuss on regulatory perspective on distribution reforms. Mr. Sujay S. N. Gupta, partner McKinsey, who will give a presentation on analysis of DISCOM performance as per 12th integrated report. We are also happy to have Mr. Ashish Goel, CMD UPPCL, Mr. Manu Srivastava, ACS Energy Department MP, and Mr. Alo, Energy Department Rajasthan, who will discuss on challenges in distribution reforms. All the above distinguished speakers are stalwarts in their field and are known to almost everyone in this uh, in this delegation dele uh, to all the delegates though distribution sector reforms have continued for more than two decades but considering the challenges and complexity of the sector and in spite of continuous improvements in performance of discoms the combined losses of discoms were still around 67000 crore last year our country requires financially strong distribution sector so that the sector attracts investments required for growth, modernization, and more importantly, for energy transition to achieve net, net zero. Different states and DISCOMs have followed different pathways for reforms, keeping you the different challenges each state faces with regard to availability of power, paying capacity of uh, consumers, and economic requirement in each state. This varied experience is of considerable importance for central policymakers for extending further reforms. Some of the major and apparent improvements in DISCOMs are AT&C losses have substantially come down. Availability of power in rural areas has gone up. State governments have now started paying subsidy in advance, which is substantially reducing the financial stress on DISCOMs. We shall be discussing all these issues and challenges in next three hours. Now a word about India Energy Forum. You all might be aware India Energy Forum is not for profit, non governmental organization with unique position of having all verticals of energy under one roof that is oil and gas, nuclear, power, coal, TND, regulatory, renewable, etc., which is, I think, unique for any organization in our country. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, today a galaxy of uh, stalwarts for webinar. And this is thanks to our president, Shri Arvi Shai, uh, chairman of the TND vertical, Mr. Anil Sardana, who is also MD Adani Energy, and Mr. Sanjay Banga, who is convener for uh, 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 transmission distribution and also president TND. I welcome uh, uh, you all uh, again for this webinar, and I am sure this three hours of uh, interaction. Three hours of webinar, which will have half an hour of interaction at the end, will be of extremely useful to all of you. Uh, with these words, I request Mr. Anil Sardana for setting the context and taking the discussion forward. Mr. Anil Sardana, please. Good morning, everyone. I to extend warm welcome to Secretary Power, Mr. Pankaj Agrawal. Also, thanks to all the members who have joined this call. Thanks to Suvajay and the other panelists. Uh, we will have the panelists join. May I request others to be on the mute, please? Yeah, so so the panelists will join as as we go along because uh, they have their other commitments, etc. But uh, let's quickly launch ourselves into this very vexed subject. All of us are aware that uh, in the recent years, Ministry of Power with their interventions and some of the other players, be it in the government sector at the state level, central level, various uh, entities that are participating in the power system as also the uh, uh, the associates have done an amazing job in terms of bringing enhanced discipline i think thanks to some of the intervention of ministry of power like lps schemes etc today one sees far greater discipline in the sector compared to what existed 
hitherto before. So that's something one should feel very honored. In fact, the other part, many of us are not aware of the fact that how the power system has been able to cope up with the uh, enhanced participation of RE. Uh, all of us are aware as of today, thermal has got relegated to almost like 50% of the capacity. 31% capacity is now of renewals. And then we have the hydro and, and the nuclear, uh, very little of gas. But in terms of uh, sector actually responding to the times when RE comes in and goes out, uh, you know, perhaps we are the only singular example in the globe where the entire heavy lifting is done by thermal. In fact, uh, many of us should take pride in the fact that on the day when we achieved the highest peak, uh, the thermal really ramped up almost like a number of around 40 gigawatt. And I think we would request Secretary to bring forth that point too. And eventually, uh, you know, we must also celebrate the fact that it's discoms which eventually enabled meeting those uh, requirements while the sector responded to this part. But since today's subject is uh, distribution, and especially in terms of the fact what's happening there, I will therefore quickly shift to the distribution part. We know that uh, in, in the other two sectors, generation as well as the bulk transfer of electrons, transmission, we have almost reached the global benchmarks levels. All the generating companies as well as Transcos today can compare themselves to the benchmarks that exist globally and hats off to some of the starlets that exist, uh, likes of Shoni and many others who have done that uh, in terms of uh, bringing our grid to that level that we can today take pride in not only just meeting the requirements, but also being benchmarked. However, in the distribution, we cannot say so. Uh, we all are aware that our last mile still has lots of challenges. And the challenges are not in terms of the fact that we cannot uh, get things done to the benchmark levels, but somehow or the other, uh, in terms of the way the structure has existed, uh, we are not able to really turn the tide and say that in entire distribution arena, we are again benchmark. And I'm sure that time is not very far where with the intervention of policymakers as also participants, we will soon get to that level. And I think that's a pride that we must bring to the sector because it is the last mile which ultimately uh, is the one which takes the benefits to the customer. And that's where three paradigms are critical for us to really understand in terms of first is the answerability to customer uh, for reliability, predictability. The second is the commercial viability of the sector as also uh, the fact that the customer should be able to commercially find it uh, prudent. And the third part, which is also very important and particularly in a customer facing business is the fact that you modernize, you upgrade constantly and future proof your business to what's evolving. Now today with the advent of AI, with the advent of machine learning, one really expects that the sector will not only answer the first two parts of reliability, predictability as also being commercially savvy, but also upgrade and modernize itself uh, for the on the technology evolution that's happening. So that's that's a objective. That's the expectation that one has from the sector. Now, in order to achieve this, it's important that some kind of a reform process uh, takes place. We have had advent of IPPs, we have had advent of IPTCs, we have had uh, mechanisms by virtue of which the rest part of the sector has seen competition, the rest part of the sector has seen change, reforms, and therefore today we can say with pride that we are one of the benchmark uh, operators or benchmark, uh, you know, um, benchmark in those uh, management of those assets and sectors. Now, you know, it's been a long time that people have actually uh, ducked under the embrace of the fact that we have responsibility towards rural, we have uh, challenges in terms of 
meeting their the needs and therefore the strategic disinvestment in this sector is is a challenge. But I think those are LIBs as I see it. It's very clear that one can always have models of the kind that one has seen in Delhi in terms of strategic disinvestment, uh, Odisha where uh, similar concepts have happened. And also the fact that nothing stops to have a model, which we have talked about many times, that you have an urban area, which is given at the same time, the rural area, say 50 uh, kilometer concentric circle to that urban area is also given at the, uh, for the strategic disinvestment. And except that you could do the time phasing to say that if the zero date is today, urban area gets on to you and three years or five years you manage upgrade of that network, invest in the rural side because the number of units handled is large, modernize all aspects related to customer interface, but you are to back it by a bank guarantee and after three years or that five years prescribed time, that rural geography also becomes part of your reform agenda and, and you become the owner of that too. And therefore you cannot cherry pick and you therefore can have a mechanisms by virtue of which uh, the discoms can be strategically disinvested to players who will be responsible. And I have also been mentioning that there is no need to create this large behemoths as it exists in many states today. For example, large geographies like UP, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, you go, the, and Rajasthan, etc. the size of the discom is too large for anyone to really manage and come to terms with the entire thing in a granular manner. We can divide these into three parts and amongst three or four parts, give one to the employees itself. So that that controversy of the employees to say, you know, we are being ignored and, you know, we know it all and we, we can do it as well, except for government interference, we could have done much better. And I think we should call it out and give it to those people also and ask them to run that in the current dispensation and take enhanced responsibility and even employees could be given ESOPs to the extent of 5% so that they have stake in it. And then we can have provision to say if there are four discoms carved out of an existing large discom that uh, in five years or seven years of performance, uh, if one of the four will be folded into the best and so on and so forth so that eventually we could instead of four have two, those kind of things can always be done and those paradigms can create competition and therefore bring wow factor to the customers. That's the most important part. Having stated the objectives and have stated the need for reform, let me also bring about the important element where, you know, some of our starlets on the call are regulators, ex-regulators, some of them are going to be the current regulators who will perhaps uh, bring forth their point of view. But I feel there is a need to do capacity building of regulators. I guess for them to understand how to do balance between development and customer interest is a very important part. It's not easy. Uh, one has to learn out of uh, evidential experience that exists elsewhere in the globe. And that's something very important because many of this answerability today that one sees uh, does not come to the fore is by virtue of uh, lack of that, that sort of input, lack of that oversight. And similarly, I guess, uh, you know, some of the other regulatory institutions need to be strengthened. And we have been on record as an industry requesting policymakers to look at regional regulators, especially for discounts, uh, or, you know, have consistency of regulations across India, because otherwise, one finds that, you know, many, many means which are basics to the discipline in the sector are actually ignored by the regulators uh, due to various political pressures or pressure of their stakeholders. And with the result, the sector continues to suffer. And there are several examples you will perhaps hear here during the day. And I don't want to dwell into that um, right now. I will say that this is one of the most important parts. You know, additional part that I would say, which is the last part, that we need to be conscious that the distribution companies across the globe are now seeing paradigm shift in the way uh, they, they are evolving. We are still 
on an archaic principle, but they are moving to peer to peer trading in terms of the fact that there are models where the uh, customers are now, uh, you know, putting rooftop or their own uh, solar uh, facilities, which they are also entitled to trade. Similarly, electric vehicle storage, when they don't use the vehicle, they're allowed to trade uh, and, and participate in various mechanisms, including ancillary power, division settlement, or even peer-to-peer -peer trading with the neighbors. So those concepts are evolving. Similarly, there are examples where today large loads that are coming through data warehousing, uh, whether you call them a data center park, you call them as uh, edge data centers or hyperscaler data centers, uh, you know, these are all seeking solutions which are very distinctive. They are looking at power quality, they are looking at 100% traceable green electrons, and we have to move out of our current situation to address some of those issues. We cannot but get that investment only if we have those solutions inside. And I guess it's important that regulators open up to this part and facilitate those mechanisms. Otherwise, we will not get those investments. Or you can say only those states which are progressive to see through this coming will get the investments. Uh, there are beautiful examples like Texas in the world which has moved away from the uh, grid system for a long time. Now they're encouraging behind the meter concepts to large data centers, to large cryptocurrency operators. And, uh, and it's fun to see how large refineries, how large uh, you know, uh, plants of carbon sequestration, how large data centers are coming with just behind the meter concepts with very little or floating connectivity to the grid. And I think we have to address those issues. If we don't, uh, people will stop investing in our countries and that will be only sad. I will just touch the last part and I'll expect we to debate this point that how the government of India is promoting smart grid, smart metering, uh, smart city. But I think the smartness there is eventually in terms of uplifting the capability in terms of the technology. How do we start to put the technology interface in real time basis? How do we make sure that energy accounting is real time? How do we make sure that we use the data that comes out of smart meter to mend our networks, to get our grids uh, designed in such a way that wherever extra capacity exists, that shifts wherever there is shortage. I guess it should not be used just to reduce at &C losses, but it should be used for intelligent grid management, intelligent network enhancement, and intelligent services to customers. Whether you upsell, whether you cross-sell, those are stuff that smart meters facilitate. But more important part is how do we get the data? How do we get the data of equipment to get enhanced residual life and ensure life extension of all the equipments there is an old saying, equipments never died. People like us, which caused the peril of death to the equipments. And I think that statement is valid here. And today technology is clearly showing that the equipments can be uh, deployed to run repair rather than replace. The replace option is a very expensive option for customers. And therefore run and repair is what we must adapt and practice. I'll stop here. Once again, request uh, uh, all our panelists and all our other colleagues to participate in this last critical issue and support the policymakers and the other participants to ensure that we can bring wow moments for the customer by virtue of enhanced reliability, competitive cost, and enhanced services. So thank you so much. <coughs> and once again, I appreciate everybody joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sardana, for providing us a very comprehensive context setting and bringing the richer experience on distribution reforms. Uh, may I request now our President India Energy Forum, Mr. R. V. Sahi, for his presidential address. Thank you, Sanjay. Let me, on behalf of the India Energy Forum, welcome all the participants and very particularly my good friend, 
Mr. Pankaj Agarwal. I was there with him some days ago and I requested him if he could be the chief guest for today's session. And he readily responded that definitely this is an important subject. I think for the first time we have from the state sector, a government official who also headed a distribution company. And that is the time when I was at the helm of affairs in the Ministry of Power and we used to have interactions. So we have in him, Mr. Agarwal, one who has the grassroots experience of uh, the problems, the challenges, the complexities, the political compulsions, political, some of our friends say political economy of electricity distribution and all this uh, Pankaj has gone through. And now he is at a very important point of time when India has crossed 250 gigawatt of uh, supply. Uh, we have uh, close to now 450 gigawatt very soon that we will have 450 gigawatt of capacity. One step that we took to open up to de-license generation and that has given us uh, a lot of benefit over a period of last 20 years. We also opened up transmission through our policy under the Act and that has again given a lot of benefits. I used to say those days uh, to my friends, to my special secretary, additional secretaries and joint secretaries that Legislation provides a framework, but we need to have Sutradhar to implement the various provisions of the Act. And that is how competitive bidding guidelines, tariff policy, and a whole rest of range of policy came. Even Electricity Act, which fell short, and since I was there, I must say that something more perhaps could have been done to open up distribution. But whatever has been done in the Act also, we have not been able to move forward much. And it is there where some soul searching has to be done, some introspection has to be done, and it is never too late to, to get on. Uh, Anil just now mentioned about uh, further looking forward of what is happening internationally, how the quality of power, harmonics and type of things on the decentralized system of people getting power, things are changing market structure all over the world uh, is changing whether we have done enough of course india had a different problem when we entered the century we had more than 60 percent of india unelectrified households in terms of that must be much more in many of the villages many of the uh, states but some of the provisions that we brought it is there where one feels a little disturbed that even the provisions that we brought, take for example, electrification, rural electrification policy provided, uh, Anil just now said decentralization. It provided that one megawatt and below generation, transmission and distribution, everything is de-licensed. It is there where Sutradhar was perhaps needed. That was not the right time because we did not have solar technology affordable. Now we have. That is one provision which holds tremendous potential of decentralized distribution, gen distributed generation, opening up the sector, particularly even now India has more than 65, 70% in rural sector. So therefore rural economy, so that provision does exist. And over a period of time, legislation has been interpreted even by the Supreme Court and tariff policy, electricity policy, and rural electrification policy. Policies as provided under the act have the same power as the act. The provisions of the policy has similar strength and therefore we should use that similar strength. So that is something which could, it is not too late. In fact, it is timely. Could we instigate this process? Could, could we catalyze this process? Could we ask the, those days I used to say that uh, we want uh, Hindustan liver in Indian rural area. I know Hindustan liver name itself is changed and therefore a lot of options to people, a lot of options to people. And that can be done with riding over the solar technology that is today available. And it also takes care of a number, number of things. 
We have a provision in the act that open access should be provided. In fact, this legislation got stuck up for quite some time, for a few months, and we have to put an amendment that this open access should be having teeth into it. The earlier provision did not have teeth in the sense that it was not made obligatory on the part of the regulatory commission to definitely provide open access facilitation. In spite of that, in spite of that, I think this has remained more or less un, an unimplemented provision, more or less. I mean, even critical mass is not there. Why? Because through the process of surcharge, additional surcharge, etc., etc., it has happened again there. We have a teeth under our tariff policy to, to sort of uh, work out with the states in consultation with the states. We need to convince the states that it is in their interest that the sector comes out of the financial problems that every two, three years it has to go through and some bailing out is required to be done. So that is one good provision. Another provision which we brought at a very late stage through the intervention of a standing committee and that is parallel licensing. That you can have parallel licensing and provide competition. So there are provisions. I would definitely say that this act, though it fell short of opening up or short of providing uh, a bit better changes in the structure of the electricity sector, insofar as distribution is concerned. Yet, I also must say and must reiterate that a little bit of provision that were made, which could catalyze this process into becoming a better change for the distribution, a better health for the distribution sector financially and also from the point of view of consumer services. There, we fell short in implementation, not implementation, not in uh, sort of provisions. Of course, a lot is required. I think we cannot have one size fit all for all the states. There are states, there are cities, there are towns, there are rural areas which are better looked after, better done. There are others which are not. So definitely India has complexities, India has diversities. We have southern states, there are some issues. We have northern states, there are some issues. So therefore, we have to have a menu of options. And in that menu of options, what is important is that we must made it, make it obligatory. Take, for example, when we did the rural electrification program, this got again stuck up. 90% grant funding, and there's the time perhaps Pankaj might have been in one of the distribution company. I don't, I'm not very sure. Rural electrification program was a revolutionary program. 90% grant funded and 10% also provided by way of loan for a nominal listing from the rural electrification program. Do you know that this got stuck up? Planning commission had a view, finance ministry had a view, and we had very strong finance minister and very strong deputy chairman of the planning commission. Yet we got it. And you know on what basis we got it? When we were asked that already you are in financial mess, when you give 90% grant, it will uh, unfold into a large volume and how do you manage the financial thing and the answer that our ministry gave was that we have made obligatory on the part of the states to provide franchisee arrangement we put rec on the job a booklet was prepared input based franchise and i was surprised i did not know for at least two three years when this clause was withdrawn by the ministry of power through a cabinet decision this provision of obligatory requirement on the part of the states to definitely get into franchisee arrangement that was taken away from the entitlement criteria for the grant funding. So I think these are some of the things which did exist, but of course, this is past. We should look forward. I had a very pleasant discussion some days ago with uh, Pankaji in his office, and he is very keen and he has a background. And we converged on this that we will have to have menu of options. Definitely, there are silver linings. There are towns. There are towns and adjoining areas which are doing very well, even not in all states, but many states. One thing is definite that whatever opening up we do in next four, five, ten years, we don't see that the entire distribution is privatized or in a different arrangement, nor is it so in case of generation, nor it is so in case of transmission. What is important is that we should cross the critical mass, establish certain models of success, and these models of success will be relevant to different situations, give the menu of options, but make it obligatory somehow. I don't think PFC and REC doors should be open to bail out for those states which are non-performers. This has also been one of the things. Because in one of the regulators, AGMs, I mentioned that 
if we apply the same criterion that we apply to the rating companies on NCLT when they are not paying the loan to the distribution company, most of these distribution companies, if not all, will qualify for NCLT and they will get privatized anyway. But, but we bail out. So we feel unhappy about it, we bail out also. I think we have political compulsions, we can't close our eyes to these requirements for the rural area particularly, also for the urban area, yet we should be in a position to explain, convince our people and give them the choices, but they must do something. So I think listing of the people, companies which are doing very well, I must tell you that 2003-04 we did not have even NTPC listed and when we have listed there is a successful record. So therefore there is no reason why many of our distribution companies even under the state dispensation cannot qualify for that arrangement. We could have a strategic disinvestment, not with 50-50, not 49-50. We must give to the newcomer 51% so that management interference is not there. That is another option. So I think and then we should do franchisee. We should do parallel licensing. I think parallel licensing, franchises, decent, uh, the listing is still remaining with government and strategic disinvestment. These are four or five areas and also one megawatt can be extended to two megawatt in the, that uh, rural electrification policy and open up totally generation, transmission, distribution. No license is required except for environmental control. These are some of the thoughts which can be further deliberated and discussed, but we must feel uneasy about distribution and the present private Power Secretary is feeling uneasy about distribution and he has the experience and he has the clout and he will have the conviction and he will have acceptance because he has the experience. And therefore, this is a good time that in next two, three, four years, we can change the shape of distribution. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Shahi sir. Uh, uh, I once again, on behalf of IEF, welcome uh, Power Secretary Pankaj Agrawal sir and request for his uh, keynote address on this platform. So let me start thank, with thanking Shahi Saab, Sardana Ji and Popli Ji for setting the context. As Mr. Popli referred to, there have been several achievements that we can be proud of in terms of hours of supply to the urban and rural areas in terms of reduction in ATNC losses. Even in terms of ACS ARR gap, which could be reduced to a level of 15 paise per unit, but again it bounced back to 45 paise per unit. There are several challenges and the biggest challenge before the power sector, I would say, is the financial sustain sustainability of the distribution companies. We have been pondering over various ideas. Uh, the idea of parallel license with network optimization, listing of discoms, mandatory migration of HD consumers towards open access, strategic disinvestment, franchisees. Last three months actually gave us ample time to reflect on uh, various options. I have been meeting the thought leaders, industry, and other stakeholders and asking for their responses to all the five ideas. The, I'll start with the listing of discounts. Very recently, we thought of going for a dip test. And the response from the merchant bankers and the investment advisors has been that it is the regulatory risk which will basically not allow to succeed any such listing to lead any particular gains to the distribution companies. And I would uh, like to further dwell upon it. Like as of 7th of June, 2024, 25 out of 36 states have not issued their tariff orders for 24-25. Mind it, the tariff orders were to be issued well before March of 2024. 
27 out of 36 states have not issued the true order. So, so it is the political sensitivity of the regulatory exercise, particularly related to the tariffs. I think that continues to be a big risk. A number of states, though, have adopted the fuel and power purchase cost adjustment mechanism, but I think the adoption has been half-hearted. There have been artificial limits which have been put on the surcharge that can be levied on the customers. If we add the dots, we can very well explain the annual losses of more than 67,000 crores of the distribution companies and the accumulated loss of close to 7 lakh crores of all the distribution companies in the country. While we have addressed the issue of access, I think Anil very well uh, dwelled upon the, idea, the issue of reliability of supply, that too in an environment of surging demand, growing share of renewable energy, growing share of distributed renewable energy resources. He may refer to the data centers, and I would put it in a generic category of solid state loads. This is going to require huge amount of investment. While the financial sustainability or the viability of the distribution companies uh, is a matter of concern, the requirements in terms of investment from the distribution companies are enormous. We have recently studied uh, uh, four cities. We started with Varanasi, then Noida, then Gurgaon, and Faridabad. I was asked by the CAQM to do something about the NCR region in terms of quality of supply to eventually get rid of the requirement of DG sets. And we have undertaken exercise in collaboration with the states, both Haryana and uh, Uttar Pradesh. And in our understanding, like uh, uh, Noida is going to require an investment of 1,500 crores. Gurgaon will require another 2,000 crore. Faridabad will require about 2,000 crores. We have sanctioned project for about more than 1,000 crores for Varanasi. So if this is the kind of investment requirement to provide a reasonably good quality of supply. When I say reasonably good quality of supply, I use the Delhi quality of supply, which is being maintained by Tata's and Adani's as the benchmark. And if I use that, that essentially means that not more than one hour of all trippings in a year per consumer, and not more than three trippings a consumer should face in a year. This is a very simple formula, three and one. Three trippings, one year, one hour over a period of one year per consumer. And the Requirement of investments uh, comes out, uh, runs into thousands of crores. So, how do actually we go forward? Can the states can uh, bring in the requisite equity? States are already providing about one lakh eighty-seven thousand crores as the tariff subsidy. That means the distribution companies nationally, if we see, on an average, they are getting their 20% revenues from in the form of tariff subsidies. If we further examine this data, then states like Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh are actually receiving 50% of their revenues in the form of tariff subsidy. So this states already have serious fiscal stress. That essentially means that there is requirement of bringing in private resources. And if the private investment is to be brought in, I would very well agree with the Anilji and also with Shahi Saab, that we have to put in the models which are attractive for the private sector. As I see, strategic disinvestments appear as a very, very viable model and this is my personal view, because I am yet to put it before the political executive and get a buy-in. Uh, 
we, we have a successful model in Delhi, which has done phenomenally well. All of us are aware of the success story of Delhi. There has been the idea of parallel license uh, that we have been discussing, but under the present legislative framework, I believe there will be issues of, uh, you know, over building of the network, over investment in the network. There could be the idea of distribution franchisee. Rajasthan has done it, UP has done it, and I think their, their experience has been successful. Probably the existing model needs to be tweaked further to enable significant sufficient investment in the distribution sector. I'm really not very confident of what is going to work, but uh, I would agree with the Shai Saab that a cafeteria of successful models should be put in and which should provide sufficient policy options to the state governments and the distribution companies. So what I would actually look forward to, I think, is the regulatory certainty, number one. Number two is bringing in private investment in the distribution sector. And number three, I would say what the my previous minister of power used to say, keep his tariff cake business go depoliticize. I think these are the three things probably if we really do, uh, I think uh, we can really move forward. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I would request uh, the organizers of the conference that if the recommendations of the group could be shared with us, we are looking for uh, the uh, potential options and we'll be too happy to put up those options before the political executive. Thank you so much. And I wish this conference all success. Thank you very much, sir, for your very insightful speech and giving us guidance on very important aspect of regulatory certainty, uh, tariff depoliticizing, and of course, the way you mentioned about MP and Rajasthan getting subsidy to survive and financial sustainability is, is the most important for distribution sector. Thank you from IEF side, sir, uh, for sparing time for us. Uh, before we go for uh, my friend Suvaj's presentation, I would request uh, Mr. Alok Kumar, who has been deeply associated with sector, and we have a privilege to him uh, here also, both in UP as well as in central government, to give us uh, some insight on his thoughts on this sector. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I hope I am audible. You are audible, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a real uh, delight to be in this program with Arvi Shahidi and Mr. Dana and my dear friend Ankar and all veterans. I'll take maybe five to six minutes to share my thoughts. It's a, it's a subject which is very close to my heart. Ankar, going forward, that the need is to invite private investment in distribution, I would like to put up. If India has to become a developed country and meet the aspiration of Vixit Bharat and meet the demand, forget about energy transition. We cannot meet the demand if we don't make distribution sector viable. And uh, I have quoted it many forums, the type of investment you require even next 10 years in Power sector, the generation, transmission, distribution is more than 50 lakh crore. So these are the plans which are issued by ministry and see if you add up the generation, a plan, transmission plan and distribution requirements, say. The 50 lakh crore will not come unless until distribution companies are viable. So I'll put energy transition at a second place. First place is your meeting demand. You have been we have been able to do 250 gigawatt, but we don't continue our journey and our pressure to make distribution sector continuously viable. We will fail miserably and we will face blackouts because no private investor will put in his money in renewable energy projects and transmission projects unless until he is sure of getting his payments back. And unless until you get your investments in your generation projects and transmission projects, 
government of india or state governments don't have capacity to bring in that much of capital to fund those expansion of the power system that is one about privatization i agree with uh, what suggestions were given by mr anil sardana you have to innovate models and talk more with the unions my take is unions resistance is a facade the ministers and state governments are not convinced to give up their power if i know the i can't share the exact details what goes into the say when the, there is a protest or what goes into the background thing it is basically we have to convince the state leadership that they have to give up their patronage to forward it will take time so what is on the table the atnc losses have come down to now less than 16% and my conviction is if we collectively with the blessings of ministry power and with the blessing of the new minister can roll out the smart metering in next 2 to 3 years the billing efficiency will go up from 86% to 92% and you will touch in atnc losses of close to 10% that is i think what is the most the aspirational thing we can do in india if we can get to 10% of atnc losses in tenure of mr pankaj agrawal i think whole world will set up and look at us we uh, have done four uh, interventions to force to discipline states for sector viability and lpsc rule the rdss scheme 0.5% borrowing of gsdp by the states and your additional potential norms i am very sure and i hope that new ministry will continue to put their foot down that these things are not diluted because moment you send a message that okay there is a room for flexibility i say the laxity the, it will not take more than 6 months to go back to the bailout stage i am not in at all in favor of bailout we should raise as there were several uh, separation suggestion might you know to go for a bailout uh, states used to come uh, i was able to convince and my minister that oh, we should not talk of bailout at all we should keep our pressure on next thing which i want is as long as we still have the state government own discoms two things are very important first is the these discoms are engineers oriented i am also an engineer so is also engineer but discoms are now it companies they should be they should be restructured to have separate verticals for commercial staff and for it staff if you go to uppcl maybe ashish will speak there is a great resistance from engineers to create any post for it cadre they say no it will be all engineers if we don't transform the discoms by having the verticals for it and for commercial staff right from the division to the top level board <coughs> level we will not succeed because like banks have transformed into it companies discoms are now it companies after smart metering and your commercial commercial very important engineering very important but engineering will really, will become a service department rather than the core business department i can share uh, with some maybe with some rethinking and some hindsight benefit when you come out with a new bill because my sense is that the earlier bill has left the lok sabha if we can do little more interaction with the states there will be greater chances of success i tried but i could not succeed we have to bring states on board when we talk of retail competition it is an idea which has a mixed uh, say experience world over if you read the literature retail competition has not succeeded much world over there are different type of, of utilities even in us and europe but retail competition has a benefit of putting the discount under competitive pressure we have to work more with the states to move to direction of retail competition that's a, that is a one major reform which is still remaining in india i have must say my personal feeling that honorable power minister he has won laurels by pushing haryana uh, pushing power sector reforms in haryana it's a very big message with the new government is given and i am very sure that wonderful team with honorable minister and my dear friend pankaj agrawal we will push power sector reforms further and give a message that there is no laxity it will be a good thing you will have to spend more time my dear pankaj with 
coordination with the MNRA, with a separate ministry, it will be a challenge because if we have to have more renewable and large scale solar integration, and we are talking of DDG and all, DDG and rooftop can't be implemented by MNRE standalone. They need full involvement and full support from discounts. I know you will have to spend, I think, more number of hours for that. I have called out three priorities for my friends and state regulatory commissions. There are three things which are very, very critical at this function. First is a true assessment of the integration cost of renewable energy. We have come out separate rules for open access charges. The charge will not be more than 20% of the cost of supply. Your additional surcharge will not be more than the your fixed cost of power purchase, and it will reduce in four years. You have also rationalized the billing and transmission charges. But many states have now started bringing in the grid reliability charge and all. I call upon the Ministry of Power to set up a study to judge, to assess the real integration cost of renewable energy. There is a literature available worldwide. Let us do it as a model and give it to states, okay, this is the model. You can judge the real RE integration costs and your surcharges, reliability surcharge and all cannot exceed this much. I think discounts needs to be given a fair treatment that whatever the real integration cost of RE has to be paid by the open access consumers, but not more. That is first. Second important thing is the full implementation of fuel and power purchase cost adjustment. I think ministry will have to take a very strong stand that all reforms on one side and you have also said half-hearted. If we depoliticize the tariffs through fuel and power purchase cost adjustment, I think we have won 90% battle. And third important thing for the regulators is the certainty and visibility of open access charges. You revise these surcharges and the billing charges every year. Whenever we talk to commercial and industry consumers going for open access, they say our business model faces such a huge regulatory risk that after three years, some regulator will come and double the regulatory, uh, this open access charges, additional supply reliability charge. There has to be an element of grandfathering that whatever the other open access charges put together at a time of a grant of open access on a long term basis, they cannot go up by more than 20 or 25 percent in the next 12 years. So that make the business model certain. Otherwise, I'm telling you, the open access for CNA consumers will not succeed. There are serious business risks involved. And that was built in the rules. If you see, we have built a rule uh, about this, uh, uh, I think, on surcharge somewhere. Uh, I think green open access rules that your surcharge cannot exceed by more than 50% in the next 12 years from the grant of open access. That is the one thing which we also built in the UPS data center policy. We need to have a regulatory certainty and visibility for the surcharges for the consumers because they're investing money in their captive power plant. They're entering into 12 years PPA. And if you raise surcharges suddenly after three years, whole business will be become riskier and we will put the clock back. I have only one more suggestion to make in this August gathering. The government of India should also look at the power procurement cost. I'm not intending to blame game. I was the one where we had the large amount of blending at the high imported coal costs and the way we operate our markets and we develop our market. Whatever discounts are being exposed to power purchase cost, I think government of India also has a major role in all these things because we control fuel markets in India. In the northern states, government of India controls fuel markets. Government of India controls power markets. We have to put together our heads and see what measures can we take to mitigate the risk of higher power purchase costs. I was looking at the report of this first integrated rating report. The power purchase cost was increasing at 1%, 2% for the last two years. Certainly it jumped by 71 pesos in one year. So you will find it in any political system, be it Europe, be it USA, to pass on that cost in one year. So I still feel that it's an, it's an outlier and we'll be back on track by passing on the cost to tariff to fuel power purchase costs. 
So these are some of my thoughts. And thank you very much to India Energy Forum for giving me this opportunity. And I wish all the success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alok sir, for a very passionate address. Uh, may I request now Suvaje to give us more insight on distribution company's performance. Uh, we have been discussing about the pain points, but uh, I expect you to get those pens coming out from the actual data which has been reflected in 12th integrated reports. Over to you, Suvaje. And thanks. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Banga. Uh, my privilege and pleasure to be part of this forum. And also, I look forward to sharing over the next 10 to 15 minutes the salient points from the 12th integrated rating. And it's also particularly uh, with a point of note that the previous power secretary, Shri Alok Kumar, and the current power secretary, Shri Pankaj Agarwal, sponsors of this effort. And both of them are here. So thank you uh, for this opportunity. My colleague Satya Komaragiri is also there uh, with me. She will take us through a few of the pages. So if the presentation can be put up, Ravaji. Okay, sir. I can't. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. So as the presentation comes up, I think, yeah, thank you. Let's go to page four directly. Uh, and this is, as you can see, this is the 12th version of the uh, exercise. And about two years ago in 2022, uh, uh, you know, we as McKinsey were selected. PFC is the nodal uh, agency for running this exercise on behalf of the Ministry of Power. And uh, we were selected through a competitive process to carry out the 10th, 11th and 12th rating. And we did, at the beginning of the 10th rating exercise, we did a very comprehensive review and revision of the framework. And uh, some of the key points that you can see on the right-hand side, and this is the framework that has been taken forward for the 10th, 11th, and 12th ratings uh, more pretty consistently. That we actually, the big change was we moved from metrics, financial metrics on an accrual basis to a cash receipt basis which it was felt was a much more uh, uh, reliable and accurate depiction given some of the challenges and problems we've just discussed that uh, the uh, cash received basis cash adjusted metrics were a much uh, truer uh, reflection of the state of the discounts and the sector overall and we went entirely by audited accounts uh, tariff orders which are verifiable uh, data rather than what the discounts were telling us uh, and we also had this concept of dynamic ratings. Earlier, the ratings were done on an annual basis, and then there was no opportunity to revise the ratings. But there is now an independent committee uh, which revises the ratings, and there's a quarterly revision uh, element. And we also came, you know, for the first time, the private discounts were included, and the power departments were included in the ratings. And all of this has been captured in. Uh, a digital portal called Uja Drishti, which also went live a couple of years ago. And I must say, I think Sri Alok Kumar spent, I know, uh, several dozens of hours in actually coming up and helping us revise and refine this uh, framework, which you can see on the next page. We go to the next page. Five. Thank you. Yeah. So the overall the focus has been on financial sustainability, and uh, that's where you'll see that the nature of the uh, metrics are also similar to that. And there's elements of performance, excellence, and external environment. Uh, Seventy-five percent of the weightage is on financial sustainability, with a very high weightage on the ACSARR gap on a cash-adjusted basis. Uh, and that we felt was a single metric, which tells, you know, once you drill down, it tells a, a very clear story of what's happening in the sector. There were also some specific disincentives around auditors, adverse opinions, for and these are like red card kind of uh, metrics, which would uh, re uh, result in uh, points being reduced uh, overall. And this has more or less stayed uh, for the last three cycles, it has stayed uh, more or less stable. Uh, and uh, the, therefore, it is also possible from the 10th, 11th, and 12th 
rating to have an apples to apples comparison of how different discoms have moved up and down in the ratings and it's also an absolute scale not a relative scale uh, so you know this a plus a b plus and so on there's that threshold above which if you score then you move into a b plus or a b minus so it's an absolute scale let's go to the next page overall this time the 12th rating exercise which has been completed 56 out of the 59 discoms where data was available and 11 out of the 13 pds uh, participated with the pds we have a slightly different uh, um, uh, approach with a fewer number of metrics not the full set of metrics are always available now these 56 out of 59 discoms cover about 98 percent of the utility based power consumption so it is quite uh, well represented and it's been a highly interactive process uh, with them next page yeah so this is how the last you know as i said with the same set of metrics we see how the uh, rate distribution has moved and we see from the 10th rating which was in 2022 21 22 uh, we have a few more discoms which have moved into the 12th rating uh, exercise uh, and from the 11th and 12th rating the top spot was actually held by a private discom and uh, more of the private discoms have made their way into the top 10 to 15 within that and uh, the other heartening factor is the c c minus and d in the 10th rating were 35 that has come down to 17 and again this is an absolute scale so it does reflect on the uh, some improvement in the financial performance of the discoms. Of course, at an overall picture, as we will see over the next couple of pages, uh, the situation is still as been described by other uh, speakers. Uh, still a lot to do. Let's move to page nine. Yeah, uh, and this is, by the way, uh, uh, we all know this: the sharp increase in the load and the power demand over the last two years and even no, the FY20. No. FY20. No. FY24 numbers also are showing a similar trend. The first three quarters in FY24 also had an 8 to 9 percent view. And this is a really yeah, important yeah, yeah. This is an important backdrop of uh, uh, as was mentioned by Alokumarji around the in the power purchase cost as we have seen and we did some digging in the background then you know from fy18 onwards the number of long-term pps that were signed by discoms uh, came down a lot and discoms had moved uh, you know an increasing percentage of their power procurement to the exchanges and on the no, short and medium term uh, uh, now this sharp increase in demand uh, as a result, found that you know several of the discoms were under contracted as far as their long term. You know what uh, the previous minister used to uh, talk about the resource adequacy uh, is an important element. And this we see is the next page. Hello. Uh, May I request others to be on mute, please. Kumar, Mr. Yukumar, could you please mute yourself? Morning. Sir, can you please mute yourself? Mute. Yeah. Let's move to the next page. So this 71 paisa increase in uh, average power purchase cost, how did this come about? And we saw that there's sort of two important factors. One is, of course, the volume of uh, three important factors. Uh, volume of imported coal, and we know this, that there was a significant uh, increase in volume of imported coal for the generation sector from 27 million tons to about 56 million tons, uh, and uh, combined with an increase in price of uh, and, uh, the imported coal. With, you know, of course, the Section 11 being uh, uh, invoked by the ministry, this led to an increase in uh, power price. Uh, other element was the surge in power exchange prices and if you really look at how much the discoms procured in terms of number of units from the exchanges was not that high it was the same and fi 22 was maybe 84 billion units fi 23 was 85 billion units 
So it was not the volume, but actually the power sale. Uh, on an average, the power traded was at six rupees ten paisa per kilowatt hour. This is what Discoms bought on an average, uh, and that was about one point four uh, rupees per kilowatt hour, uh, hour higher than FY twenty. So these were the two factors which uh, resulted in uh, this. And what we saw is that most of this impact came in this three months, the summer months of April, May, and June, where imported coal volume uh, had a huge surge in those months. And also the power trading price was uh, uh, you know, almost double, more than double uh, in those three months in 23, FY 23 compared to FY 22. So, you know, what we see the 71 pesa, most of that impact came from those three months in, uh, in this. Next page. And this is talking about the ACS ARR and for the purposes of the rating, as I mentioned, we take a cash adjusted gap. So on absolute terms, as you can see, the FY21 number was uh, uh, you know, about a one, a 1 lakh crore that had come down to 44,000 crores in FY22 and this back up to 79,000 crores. On, on the right hand side, as you can see, the power purchase cost is increasing compared to FY22 by 71 pesa. And the revenue uh, in which is really how much of this actually got uh, passed on through tariff uh, was 46 pesa. Uh, and you know, this point was made earlier by the speakers that this has been the, the, uh, the lack of timely pass through. And of course, this was a quite substantial one year increase in the power purchase cost. All of it getting passed through was a challenge. And so overall, then some smaller adjustments, as we say that the sub tariff subsidy realization and the other subsidy realization, those were favorable. Uh, and we therefore came with a cash adjusted ACS ARR gap of 55 pesa per unit compared to 33 pesa from last year. Uh, and so this has been the major story for the FY uh, the 12th integrated rating. And uh, what this also tells us is that much more focus on long term planning of power procurement. Uh, and there, you know, we have a state by state breakup also where this gap between uh, the, the CSAR gap is particularly more acute and there is a correlation in terms of the um, short term purchases that the states had to refer to. So a couple of states like Uttarakhand it reached, reached about 15 to 16 percent of the total uh, power procurement was from uh, short term sources. Next page is on the ATNC losses which I'm not going to uh, cover too much but it was mentioned earlier it is 15.4 percent collection efficiency has improved a lot since FI21 billing efficiency is still around the 86 87 percent mark the LPS rule impact is visible in the days payable this is 126 days but that of course includes a lot of historical uh, numbers but on an ongoing basis this is around a 75 to 90 day days payable which has been a huge improvement from two years ago and receivables also given the collection efficiency and this is I think uh, a high point in terms of uh, the last three years story of continued improvement uh, on the uh, ATNC loss. Next page. Yeah, uh, the regulatory support as we say that the tariff subsidy disbursement was uh, it exceeded last year the uh, the tariff uh, subsidy received to book and it continued this year as you can see 183,000 crores compared to 170,000 crore book uh, and similar story on the additional subsidy side the tariff order I think the secretary talked about this the timeliness of tariff orders being uh, passed and the variable implementation of automatic pass through of fuel costs uh, which we talked about Regulatory assets did not change much. It was the same stagnant at 157,000 crores, which is still very high. And, uh, you know, a time bound liquidation of some of these regulatory assets would be important as we go forward. A quick word next page on the, the debt situation. Uh, there was a substantial increase in the debt from uh, 38,000 crores in last year to about 70,000 crores. And we therefore did a bit of deep dive to see where has this gone and roughly as you can see the uh, two thirds of this was used for capital investments and the rest was for 
working capital requirements, which is funding of operational cash flows and some of it for uh, funding to liquidate legacy uh, payables. Uh, so it's not uh, not all bad news that uh, you know it would be a cause for concern if most of this debt was going towards funding the gap widening gap in working capital and operating uh, cash flows. But there has some some of this has gone towards the the gross capex as you see has increased from 57,000 crore to 70,000 crore in the uh, next uh, year in uh, 22 to 23. But there's still a substantial amount that is going towards funding the operational uh, cash flows. Uh, Satya, maybe you can take the next, uh, maybe skip 15 and go to 16. And we say we, we also did a number of interactions with the disforms to say, what are you doing and how is this reduction in ATNC loss come about? How are you preparing for you know many of the things that were mentioned earlier around open access customers and so on. So and the adoption of technology. This is still very early stage, but Satya, maybe a couple of the examples you can uh, share. Yeah, it was very heartening to see the number of initiatives that the discons are driving on their own to uh, improve the quality of services, uh, to also figure out additional monetization avenues to make sure that the financial uh, situations are improved. Um, some of the interventions uh, that were discussed uh, in one on one interactions with the discoms, uh, especially the urban discoms was around improvement of network redundancy, implementation of the smart solutions. Uh, we've all seen how successfully the G20 uh, was held in India with completely uh, power supplied by the grid. Um, and uh, that was just one of the uh, examples of how. Uh, confident we are of being able to you know improve the quality of our services and uh, wide measures being taken to uh, uh, extend this to the overall network rather than just focusing on some of those very high um, visibility events also equal focus on improving customer experience uh, the number of apps that have come in the messaging systems uh, real time alerts uh, one interesting piece was the use of ai for um, you know, improving or rather doing behavioral nudges, incentivizing uh, end consumers to shift their demand patterns. Uh, this was done in Tata, uh, also awarded and recognized uh, in the industry, a very significant uh, step in terms of use of AI and modern technology to uh, fulfill some of our uh, demand uh, related challenges uh, without too much capex um, investment as well. Uh, the other aspect that we saw in terms of monetization was the green tariffs. I mean, of course, it was it has been there on paper, at least for the last 10 odd years with Maharashtra, AP, Karnataka, Odisha being the pioneers. But now uh, with all the uh, more than 15 SERCs also uh, give, allowing for green tariff provisions, uh, uh, there is a lot of movement on this front. Of course, a lot more needs to be done in terms of standardizing the methodology uh, of the application of tariffs um, uh, and how would that eventually move from HD consumers to also the end consumers, uh, retail consumers, but uh, a lot of positive movement there. We also saw significant focus on reducing theft and fraud through both uh, technology as well as uh, uh, people initiatives. Uh, uh, on technology front, the smart meters, the detailed energy accounting, drone surveillance, uh, as well as on the manual side, uh, dedicated de de departments or task force being um, looking at purely theft and fraud losses, improvements, very uh, key KPIs, KRI accountabilities uh, for those individuals uh, looking at this aspect specifically was very heartening to see. And uh, they've also uh, consequently observed a lot of improvement on uh, this front as well. Last but not the least, a lot of rural awareness campaigns, um, the Haryana, Maragaon, Jagmagaon, uh, the Orissa uh, Gram Panchayat meetings are some of the examples which stand out, but overall, um, also, just making sure that um, the, the development and the improvements are not just urban centric, but also uh, reaching to the uh, every corner of the country. So, I think, uh, I think you know, overall, I would say that we're still scratching the surface as far as the use of technology and smart uh, technologies is concerned. That's number one. 
and second when we talk to at least you know i think two thirds of the discoms uh, you know it was very clear that there's no way of you know they're saying okay we don't know what the best practices are how to adopt it and when we pointed out that some of the interesting things that even the public sector discoms are doing in other states that no means of reaching out right so that look what is haryana doing and what is assam doing and there was no forum for them to learn from each other around this and that's one of the things we have suggested in the report also that uh, just you know make sure that whatever uh, firstly some of these have to be done the investments are probably too large for individual discoms to make and second is whatever is being done in isolated pockets should not remain isolated yeah last page satya you want to cover sure um so while we do discuss structural changes in terms of improvement of discom health we've talked about uh, extending the franchisee models listing and other avenues in the current scenario as well uh, there are some initiatives that can be taken uh, not just by the discom but the other stakeholders like states uh, and regulators which can help improve uh, the fiscal discipline uh, within uh, the distribution sector on the discom side uh, some of the interventions are more accurate granular demand forecasting we now have the right technology available to uh, enables above that as well as uh, then translating that into a robust uh, power procurement plan uh, to ensure resource adequacy uh, making sure that we have the right kind of infrastructure the smart infrastructure on the demand hotspots uh, uh, looking at quality metrics as well and reducing the uh, outages as was uh, described earlier in terms of the safety safety um also in increasing or accelerating the smart meter implementation the rdss scheme overall uh, focusing on the atnc loss reduction um, and some process improvements internally in terms of how the subsidies are in, um, accounted and so on on the state side as well there is significant um, while uh, we have been seeing a trajectory of 100 plus percent uh, subsidy uh, recovery there is still um, significant regulatory assets and uh, areas which are currently due which the states could act upon as well as uh, the clearance of the government dues uh, these currently constitute almost like a third of uh, the overall receivables for the discoms um, on the regulatory aspect as well we had looked through um, how uh, frequently the pass through is happening is the automatic pass through implemented or not and there is a wide variation that we've noticed in the um uh, the regulatory uh, setup of each of these uh, discoms uh, state discoms right so uh, making sure that the automatic pass through is happening all across and happening not just say once in a month or uh, every fourth night but also a quarter but uh, on a real time basis uh, also looking at um, setting the appropriate distribution loss targets which are actually achievable by the uh, discoms uh, in line with the government schemes, uh, implementation of uh, time of day tariffs, multi year tariffs, some of the other uh, um, uh, elements uh, that we could actually look upon to uh, improve in the short term the um, fiscal discipline in the uh, discoms. Thank you. That's all we had. I think the detailed report is, of course, in the public domain now available lot of rich data which can hope uh, hopefully but i think the key points here is that look this uh, increase in demand is probably here to stay for the next few foreseeable few years and that's a good sign right that means the economy is healthy robust growing uh, of course you know the heat waves don't help but this is the right time for discoms to take appropriate action to uh, plan for the future. and the technology you know uh, adoption these were the two points Great, great. Thank you very much, Shavya and uh, Satya, for uh, giving us uh, deep analysis of discoms. And what I'm finding the common threads which are coming is again the regulatory certainty and risk, and of course the technology which is mentioned by Mr. Sardana also and Mr. Alok Kumar also is going to play a very important role in discoms performance. Unfortunately, we don't have a. Uh, uh, Mr. B. N. Sharma uh, here to give us regulatory perspective because he is in UK and Mr. Alok is being called by Chief Secretary, so he's not able to join us. But we have Mr. Ashish Goel, uh, he's CMD UPPCL. 
थैंक यू वेरी मच आशीष गोयल सर फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस हियर इन इंडिया एनर्जी फोरम वी वेलकम यू एंड वी लुक फॉरवर्ड टू द चैलेंजेस व्हिच यू फोरसी फॉर डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन सेक्टर रिफॉर्म्स एंड यूपी बीइंग अ की स्टेट एंड एनी रिफॉर्म्स देयर टेक्स प्लेस एक्चुअली विल बी टेकन टू डिफरेंट स्टेट्स आल्सो ओवर टू यू सर थैंक यू मिस्टर बांगा थैंक यू फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी टू इंडिया एनर्जी फोरम सेमिनार a very uh, good morning to all the participants and uh, it was a very illuminating presentation by mckenzie team uh, on the distribution sector and uh, uh, no doubt uh, uh, with the initiatives that have been taken for strengthening of distribution sector uh, many discoms have improved over the years and uh, in uttar pradesh also uh, we have been able to bring down the atnc losses from 30% uh, two years ago Uh, which came down to 22.9 percent last year, and in 23, 24 it has further come down to less than 18 percent or better. So uh, that way we are achieving the trajectory as uh, uh, specified under RDSS uh, program, and this is despite the fact that the benefits of RDSS uh, interventions are yet to be realized. So once the benefit of those interventions are realized, the ATNC. Uh, losses will further reduce uh, the multi year tariff uh, 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 is a big challenge although it has been specified that there has to be a multi year tariff but uh, uh, in all for all practical purposes the tariff is being decided on a yearly basis so there needs to be some uh, certainty uh, and uh, some trajectory in the tariff uh, assessment as well as uh, tariff fixation Uh, some indexation uh, might be necessary and uh, some pass through uh, like fuel purchase uh, uh, pass through is there uh, but there are many other expenses which need a pass through uh, we need standardized o&m uh, uh, cost admin cost uh, some ministry of power has been kind enough uh, to uh, constitute a committee under chairman of cea to look into this issue of uh, Uh, standardizing uh, certain O&M cost for the discom, which should be a part of the uh, tariff and not disallowed by uh, commissions. Uh, a major challenge what uh, the discom space is a very old network, and due to persistent uh, financial problems, investment in the old network has not been uh, up to the mark. Uh, in UP, we have uh, invested almost five thousand crore rupees over the last year. and as a result uh, less than 1% of our substations are overloaded as on today and i can very happily inform the house that we are consistently supplying more than 30000 megawatt uh, each day uh, and uh, uh, the last night uh, we our demand was more than 30000 megawatt uh, consistently for more than 4 hours during the peak hours so uh, that way we are achieving peak which is more than 15 20% uh, compared to the last year and the average demand has also uh, increased by more than 15 to 20% so that way our system is coping and we are able to uh, uh, supply 24 elect our our electricity to both our urban as well as uh, rural areas so that is a uh, it's a what we uh, what we focused on was the protection system of our distribution network be it substation be it transformers and that has produced wonderful results so uh, more investment in protection system more investment in removing overloading and more uh, more investment in uh, creating redundancies will certainly help uh, making the system robust for uh, uh, newer and newer peaks which are going to be uh, there every year uh, amisp smart metering project in up we are going to uh, uh, install more than 3 crore smart meters Uh, uh with our consumers and i am sure there are certain challenges because uh, uh, 2.5 crore consumers are uh, bpl and lifeline consumers which have very very uh, less uh, consumption and uh, less uh, demand so uh, uh, as we have to uh, bear the cost of amisp on a monthly basis so the challenge before the discom is how to recover uh, this revenue uh, in increment uh, from those consumers and uh, make this amisp program more sustainable but i am sure with more data that is being generated 
uh, we will be able to uh, implement TOD in all the tariff all the tariff categories, including domestic. And as uh, we we could see uh, Tata uh, Adani uh, in uh, uh, Mumbai, uh, they have used AI for uh, modulating the demand using uh, time of the day tariff. So uh, those only improve commercial parameters, but smart metering will also help uh, us in uh, managing the outages as well as in maintenance operations. Uh, we are we have uh, piloted a P2P uh, platform for. Uh, solar rooftop uh, and uh, 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 through which individual consumer can sell surplus RE during the daytime to other uh, consumers or uh, uh, who, who are uh, in, uh, who want to purchase uh, RE from other consumers. So with this P2P platform we are piloting and we will be launching very soon. And uh, we are also exploring the opportunity of distributed battery storage apart from the uh, battery uh, storages at, uh, at in concentrated centers but uh, using second hand batteries there is a uh, just like solar uh, battery storage will be able to give us uh, power during the peak hours uh, which is which are non solar hours in up so we are exploring that possibility also uh, i would like to inform the house uh, that up has been the first state to launch a new company called up rev up renewables and uh, electric vehicle uh, infrastructure company uh, so that uh, we are able to uh, provide EV charging infrastructure all across the state and we will be uh, using uh, different modalities to uh, partner with private uh, parties so that uh, we can provide the back end and the private parties can provide the front end and we can utilize the uh, unique position of uh, a public company like UP Rev to uh, get uh, land in various uh, government and other offices across the uh, on the side of roads uh, highways and expressways uh, on very uh, favorable terms so uh, up rev was launched uh, just uh, at the end uh, in may end and many stakeholders from the industry had also participated in that workshop on uh, which was held on 29th may in lucknow so we are very excited about the ev and uh, uh, and the future demand which is going to grow up, uh, grow uh, by leaps and bounds, uh, uh, and we are prepared to uh, meet that demand. When we are talking about distribution uh, uh, sector reforms, uh, partnership with private sector also comes in mind, and there are many challenges uh, uh, in that path. And uh, uh, one is uh, a template. Uh, uh, what should be the template of uh, for for a distribution reform uh, odisha has uh, shown some way and i am sure with passage of time there will be many other uh, such successful examples uh, which will throw up many successful templates and the states and discoms can choose which template to follow uh, in that direction of course uh, uh, stakeholder management uh, be it uh, the political management or uh, unions or public or a specified stakeholder and consumer groups uh, uh, to pelicate them uh, that will be a uh, great challenge in that path but i am sure with more successful examples across the country and more uh, uh, capable bidders uh, in the market uh, these challenges uh, will be met uh, in the near future so uh, i am sure uh, the way we are going uh, the distribution sector in the country will uh, uh, will uh, look up uh, and as the government of India has introduced many rules for sustainability of uh, generators uh, like LPSC rules and other uh, payment mechanisms, uh, I am sure for distribution sector also uh, uh, sustainable options need to be created. Uh, we see uh, some challenges as far as open access or uh, green open access, banking. These are certain challenges which threaten the uh, sustainability of discoms in the uh, long run. So uh, since discoms are also a public good, they need to be sustained, they need to be nurtured uh, and uh, I would uh, urge the policy makers uh, to think of discom sustainability when we are talking about uh, consumer rights as well as consumer empowerment. So uh, it should not happen that uh, uh, we only empower uh, one stakeholder and discoms become unviable and unsustainable. So with these uh, words, uh, I would like to close my uh, opinion here. 
I am very very thankful to uh, uh, Mr. Sanjay Bangaji and India Energy Forum for giving me the opportunity to uh, express my views here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashish Goyal sir, for taking time out for us uh, in this forum and bringing uh, the challenges which the UP distribution sector has. Uh, you mentioned about the 5,000 crores of investment in network and the kind of growth which we are going to see in next few years, right? The capex in distribution network going to be exponentially high. And uh, UP demand, you mentioned this year, is growing almost at 15, 20%. And that's not the case of UP. I am also finding same thing in Odisha also, where the demand growth in urban area as well as in rural area is going by almost 15, 20%. You also mentioned about the RDSS schemes, and uh, many states are depending on RDSS to ensure financial sustainability because the better commercial discipline would be there. I think this this, this project of uh, smart metering in all states is extremely important now, and it, it and if it is really implemented well, then the revenue stream for discounts could be improved in much more significant way. We have many distinguished guests and experts of power sectors who have seen journey of distribution sector in India in last 30 years. I can see name of Mr. Rakesh Nath is there, Mr. Anil Rajdan is there, Ajay Shankar sir is there. I leave this uh, house open for their observations. Uh, in the end, what we do is we, we make a summary of this webinar and then we submit this summary to Ministry of Power for their uh, action. So I open this floor and request for observations from other distinguished guests now. Ajay Shankar, sir, you are there. Rakesh Nath, sir. Yes, they are there, I'm sure. They can unmute themselves. Sony sir is there. Just one intervention I want to make. Sir. About the real actual availability of power. I think that there, all that we are getting the availability of power is all uh, estimated. and does not take into account the force outages and the unscheduled load shedding. So uh, with the advent in the technology, I think it should be possible now to get the real picture of the availability of power. And if we get that figure, then there'll be little more pressure on the distribution companies to improve. Right, sir. If we can convert this into Q&A, then, then what can happen at least through questions, uh, maybe some of us can assimilate those questions, try and answer. Sujay is already there. Uh, we have the others too. Uh, so if we can also perhaps invite members to, if they have any questions or observations, both are welcome. May I raise one question? Sir, please, sir. Uh, my one worry is about the regulatory assets increasing of the distribution companies, and neither the regulatory commission nor the state governments are taking any action. Uh, how to uh, reduce the RAs or how to recover them, or one time uh, waving off shall help uh, this one. Uh, these are facing problems of uh, even uh, the power procurement issues. They're and, and the, uh, so we are losing you. Can you switch off? Can you switch off your video and then speak? Because we're losing you. Yeah, please. I said my worry was the regulatory assets right. of the discoms, and neither the regulatory commissions nor the state government are taking any action. Uh, to to reduce the RAs or any solutions to to to, to reduce them, the uh, some of the discoms are facing problems. Even their maintenance costs are not being passed through. 
Correct. I think your observation is bang right. In fact, that's what Subhajay's report also indicated. And exactly what you said, the worry is, and I think uh, this is what Mr. Alok Kumar alluded to, this is what Secretary Power alluded to, that the, the regulatory commissions at least need to bring to fore all of these aspects and see as to what mechanism can devolve on making some of these cost-reflective tariffs getting implemented. Now, even if it's not fully chargeable, let that be held on account through the government uh, on, on behalf of the government. But at least it should be reflective so that people should know that the place or the state where they live, those people have this cost to bear. And they should also know very clearly that how much is being taken care by government or treasury and to that extent the taxpayer is suffered. So what is that is bang right. Now I think everybody is demanding this discipline to come in rather than shoving it under the carpet. Today it's very sad when you see the 12th report uh, and the latest 23-24 data you will find so many discounts have negative net worth and in several cases the net worth numbers even if they are negative they run into lakh crores. So it's it's a state which state of affair which is obviously uh, very unbecoming of any viable institution. So I completely endorse your point. So regulatory asset is just one part. One, one more issue. That is the biggest challenge. One more issue comes to my mind is that the lawlessness in the electricity sector is also increasing. The uh, the aptal judgments are not being implemented. The discounts are forced to go to the Supreme Court. And even Supreme Court's judgments are not being implemented. And there is a, a, a huge problem. For example, this is an example of Delhi. And uh, uh, we do, I don't know what is the solution to that. And one cannot resort to uh, the uh, you know, other legal issues. Even the Supreme Court's judgment has not been implemented in Delhi. The, the, uh, the regulatory commission uh, refuses to implement that, that under the Pressure of the state government. Correct. Yeah, so so you... maybe I can uh, just share a little bit. As I mentioned, you know, one lakh fifty-seven thousand crore of uh, regulatory assets are still persisting, and it is Tamil Nadu, Rajasthan, Delhi, which uh, I think ninety plus percent is these three states. And Delhi and Tamil Nadu actually increased in the last one year uh, as per the FI24 tariff orders that were available when we did the analysis. Rajasthan marginally came down. Kerala has come down. Maharashtra has actually liquidated a substantial, you know, compared to 2021, that is one state where regulatory assets have come down substantially. But of those 157,000 crores, 89,000 crores were Tamil Nadu, 48,000 crores were Rajasthan, 9,000 crores or so were in Delhi. So it is, you know, very clear where it is happening. And as was mentioned by Mr. Sardana, that uh, this is, uh, you know, time-bound action has to be taken in order to uh, liquidate and have a trajectory. Maharashtra has so shown that it can potentially be done. And, and, and the second point to which Mr. Varmaji said, uh, I'm sure uh, we will ask Mr. Shahi to also respond. Uh, yes, the discipline part, uh, you know, after all, in a democratic setup like us, uh, one has to only pursue for contempt uh, petition if the Orders of Supreme Court are not getting implemented. And I can keep, uh, quote a case in point if, if it is anything worth. Uh, we had a order from Supreme Court in one of the states and uh, the order was challenged first in terms of uh, review. Supreme Court dismissed that. Then it was ordered as curative petition. Then that, that also was sort of turned down. Then uh, they went into RERC. <laughs> so, you know, so therefore, all of this, they adapt to delay. And we went in for contempt petition and the Supreme Court summoned up people and said very clearly that I'm giving you this much time to implement the order. Otherwise, serious action will be taken under the law. So I guess people have to adapt to uh, the legal recourses. We are a democratic setup. Everyone has the right to uh, question the orders. But at the same time, if the status quo is maintained and no action is taken, I think... Uh, 
the other party has the right to question it, uh, which is what we have to do. So if there are discoms which are also conniving with the regulator and the state government, then one can't help it. That will be the state which will be reflected only in the reports. Uh, but if there are players who wish to go and uh, the process of law gives us leeway to, to go and challenge those situations. But I agree with you that those are some of the issues which are reflective in this 12th report. If you read, if you read this very clearly shows that some are in brink of disaster. In fact, uh, some of the discoms, if it was not uh, state-owned, uh, they would have been they, they would have been completely not only unviable but completely bankrupt. Right, sir. Takeshnath, sir. No, uh, one issue that has been raised in the Sujoy's presentation is the increasing cost of power right. purchase. Seventy-one paisa increase in the power purchase, which is, which is quite substantial, and that indicates the inadequate resource planning by the distribution company. And I think the regulators have to. I have to play play their role and ensure that the resource adequacy is in uh, planning is adequately ensured in the, by the distribution company and the procurement of power through long term contracts is yeah i think you touched a very important point sir let's agitate this point for a minute see this 71 paisa increase is exactly what you mentioned is because of the resource challenges because the rates at the exchange increased, they had not done long-term contract, uh, they, they, they therefore landed up into situations where they had no choice but to uh, buy expensive power. Now, on one side, uh, you know, if you remember in the earlier times, the regulators used to set up ground rules in their regulation, that 90% should be long-term, 10% you should try and buy through the exchanges, and that used to determine a particular amount of discipline. At that time, that used to get criticized to say that regulators are interfering in market play and the discoms, therefore, are not able to take advantage. And they have to commit to a, a long-term fixed cost. And with the result, they land up into you know, having poor capacity utilization factor, thereby paying for uh, the, the long-term fixed cost. Uh, and now is a regime when we have swung to the other side. That there are discounts which are not worried to have any long-term contract. With the result, they are exposed to terrible market excursions. And you, you've seen this example which you yourself said. We have seen this in our discounts too. So it's not that we're talking about only state-owned discounts. It's happened with private discounts also. So, so what's, your, what's your view? And I think it would be good to agitate this point. It is not correct say that market will not uh, develop with the long-term contracts. In fact, market will increase further, will develop further with the tying up of more power by the distribution company. No, so you are of the view that they should do long-term contracts to a large Yeah, extent, yeah at, least, at least 90%. So they become predictable. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else has any view on this? I think Shankar here. Yes, sir. Please, we were looking forward to you. I, I think we are at an inflection point of a very major transformation in terms of electricity. So I think the responsibility on discoms, on SERCs, and on people like us is much greater in thinking through the way the system is going to change in the coming years. So I'll flag only three points so I can talk for greater length. But the first is that we have succeeded so far in being comfortable on the generation side because of the long-term PPAs of the discounts. It is these long-term PPAs which have given, which have de-risk investment. So private investment in thermal generation has made us comfortable. And the entire renewable energy investment is purely private, and which is a huge achievement for India, totally unexpected uh, by some of us uh, who thought about this 20 years back. So the centrality of a DISCOM PPA 
for getting in private investment is very important. Now, the, the PPA may be not for 25, 40 years, but it must cover the debt period of the private investment because that is what allows the private investor to get in the market. So, so I think we need to push discounts to do resource adequacy planning properly and to enter into long-term PPAs to get private investment. The second point is that we are today at a situation where from a discount point of view, solar is not as cheap as it is made out to be because he's still paying the fixed cost for his long-term PPA for thermal. Therefore, it is time for discounts to look at projections of peak demand, daily as well as seasonal peaks, and then the, all of us need to think through what is the correct way of doing long-term PPA so that you have reliable supply for the summer peak as well as for daily peaks at the least cost. Because so far, reliable supply has come through long-term thermal PPAs and thermal PLFs have come down. Now we have to go beyond that. Now, uh, designing these uh, procurement contracts for peaks of a short-term periods is something we haven't done. So a lot of creative thinking discussion is required before the right kind of bids can come out in the market. Now, linked to that is, I think, the new sunrise sector, which is storage. So I was in an event a few days back, and I was pleasantly surprised by a, a private consultancy per person making a presentation saying that around the clock supply of solar or wind with storage is now around four and a half rupees. Now, the round the clock supply may not match the full demand curve, but four and a half rupees is really a winner. So I think it's time that we had a national mission on storage. Lots of storage bits come out and say, wherever you can do a solar project, I'm told you can do a CSP with uh, molten salt storage and get round the clock supply from contiguous land. Uh, I'm glad so many private developers are enthusiastic about pump storage on rivers. We need the same momentum on pump off rivers. But all these private investments will finally take place only if they're backed by a PPA. So unless there is a very aggressive pro program of doing PPAs either on, uh, you know, uh, cost plus tariff determination by CRC or SERC or competitive bidding, we will not see the surge in investments in storage that the country needs, and which in my view is now a cheaper option than large scale new thermal. So, so I think there yeah. is a lot of, I think, uh, creative thinking waiting to be done at this point of time. Thank you. Sure, sure. You wanted to say something? I have one. I have one. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. RA is a big uh, uh, problem. Can this happen that they can be assigned to the generating companies instead of firms being at a loss? And this can be then adjusted uh, by and by during the uh, power payment cost, etc. So that the discounts shall be free from RS. So I think eventually everything has to flow back from the tariff. Whether it is given to generator, eventually it will be again in the cost of the uh, cost that the consumer has to pay. So today, in fact, there are other means which were suggested once upon a time in Delhi. I recall when I used to be associated, PFC had said and REC PFC had said that today the cost, cost of carrying on the regulatory asset is being paid at almost like 14-15%. They had said we are willing to, if the government of India can make it into a tax-free bond, we will raise tax-free bonds and we will offer that at 6-7% so that at least the carrying cost will reduce and therefore the overall burden will reduce. So there are innovative methods by virtue of which this can be, the burden can be reduced. But the, the sad commentary is neither regulator nor state-owned DISCOM nor the participant players are actually interested in resolving that issue. They just want status quo so that it becomes somebody else's problem after, after some time. And I think that's how it's been going on and not getting resolved. That's the way that we have seen this lingering on for a long time. 
I should take some initiative, I suppose. Sujay, so, yeah, you wanted to say something. I, I agree. The of power actually cannot do Mr. anything at this state subject. To... There has been many letters which have been sent by Ministry of Power to different state government. But unfortunately, in as per our act and constitution, uh, nothing can be done from central government on that front, sir. That's the reality. I, I would like to push the argument. The central government can make a rule which is, says that regulatory assets mean these things and it cannot be anything more than this. There is a rule, sir. The asset of this order is a great innovation in the world by our SERCs. In accountancy, no, no, so is... far, it has no legitimacy. So I think the CEO ah, government can easily come out with a rule. Let a state government challenge it that the rule is illegal. I don't think they will be able to sustain that challenge in a court of law. But the regulatory commission listens to the state government. Now this is the problem. No, no. If there is a rule, then the SERC is bound by it. I'm not talking of policy directive. I am talking about uh, explicit rule. No, no, Mr. Ajay Shankar, I just want to say there are many rules by central government and to this extent, there's a rule even on the regulatory asset. But I agree with what Varmaji is saying. Somehow, because they are back to the wall, neither the state regulator, not the state government, not the state discom is able to right now find answers to it and therefore they want the status quo to continue. Uh, otherwise, the state the central government has a clear Again, the, the state government, the central government can be firm. No more fall of credit from PFC, REC to you till you abide by the rule. No, no allocation but, from SEKI but, till you abide by the rule. I mean, no, central government has been very reluctant to be firm and hard with the state governments. But, yeah, they every time this com is put into the problem. No. Red but, line, uh, they come back. Or they, so we can, we can this so point as a recommendation. We have had the need for three bailout packages. I mean, no, the no, first we can, we can one was can, supposed to be the dissolution. Yeah, please. We can move to the other issue. We can include this as a part of recommendation anyway, because okay. it is important to re-emphasize this more and more. Uh, any other point? Any other point? Yes, or I just wanted point? to, you know, this point about resource adequacy in long term. So just building on what Mr. Rakesh Nath and Ms. Dr. Rajesh Shankar mentioned. So in our, you know, interactions with some of the states, it was, you know, we asked the question, how are you actually doing demand forecasting now? You know, how are you taking into account smart metering? How are you taking into account distributed generation that's going to uh, come in? Uh, the fact that both intraday and interday shape of the curve is changing. We just saw, you know, April, May, June, three months. That was the one that blew that entire 71 paisa thing out of the window in three months. Right? And there was very little aware well, awareness was there, but very little capability in terms of doing that more sophisticated demand forecasting uh, in there. Similarly, on uh, renewable absorption in the system. So, you know, you hear about storage. But that's one element. You know, there are many other sources of flexibility. We need to be solving for flexibility, not just storage, right? And so, therefore, one suggestion could be that, you know, through maybe CEA or other appropriate body, that a couple of reference models can be created which can be made available to the state. One is like a reference model for doing more sophisticated, granular, short, medium, and long-term demand forecasting. Coming out of that, therefore, the, the power procurement, how much uh, long-term PPA, medium-term, short-term can be done, matching the supply with demand, that can be done. And another reference model around as the percentage of renewables, both distributed and centralized renewables is going on, what are all the sources of flexibility and, and how do you integrate those into one single roadmap? So those two could be suggestions that can be made to the central government. Sure. Uh, Sanjay, since... Uh... We sort of exhausted discussions. Could you invite the president to give his remark and then you can wrap it up? Sure, sir. So, uh, requesting uh, Shahi, sir, for the concluding remarks uh, on this webinar. Shahi, sir. Ravaji, is he there? He's, he's there. He's on mute.
Yeah. Are you able? Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Uh, request for your concluding remarks. Okay. I think uh, this has been very involved discussion, and I think we had all the experts. Uh, we have Ajay Sankar, we have Alok Kumar, we have Rakesh Nath, Mr. Verma, and then Secretary himself was there. Uh, Anil opened the discussion with context setting. I made some remarks. But somehow the discussion tended to entire policy of the power sector rather than focusing exclusively on how do we reform distribution. When we had only state electricity board, then you will talk about why PLF of UP is less. They will say, I have problem in rural electricity supply, I have problem in uh, agriculture, I have problem on this, and then therefore we restructured the electricity board into generation transmission distribution company. See, the issue is definitely distribution gets affected and everybody gets affected. Why distribution? Generation also gets affected if distribution is not doing well. Distribution will get affected if from generation side procurement cost, transmission cost is high. But we sometimes run the risk of these debates getting into total issues and then get confused. So the discussion to me appeared to be more being a little sympathetic to distribution companies. And those people, what can they do? Coal price became so high, procurement cost became so high, exchange price became so high, etc., etc. So that is the story. The question is, this is one. Second is, if you take the whole of electricity distribution company in the state, rather than find out the fault lines, then obviously then, because when I was long back, I was in the Ministry of Power in one discussion, and we talked Haryana. And the point made from the very senior level, Haryana is doing very well. So I gave two, three examples of Haryana towns, including Faridabad, where they are doing very bad. The point is that we have to find out among the states, of very many states, which are the areas which need improvement. I mean, one thing is very clear, the opening up the entire distribution sector, a structural change of the entire distribution sector, lock, stock, and barrel, politically will be difficult and where are the takers so therefore we have to it's like we have one delhi we project this delhi as a model of doing some good work and from 50 to 60 percent loss we have come down to six seven eight percent or something like that i think to that extent uh, there are issues of distribution our secretary himself more or less he remained confined to what do we do on distribution now we will see what do we do with the regulator. We will do what do we do with generating company. We will see what do we do with transmission company. With regulators, definitely we have to hold them accountable for many of the things they have not been able to do, what they can do. Another thing that came out is that one size will not fit all. There will be states where taking political issues into consideration, taking their present situation of doing well, in many places, not doing well in so many places. What type of various options uh, out of the menu of options that we can do, but we must do. Since the regulatory asset is there, therefore we will not touch distribution company institutional framework, cannot be the case. Since procurement cost is going to be high, imported coal will continue to be there for some time till coal sector improves. And therefore we will not do anything to the distribution company and make that as an excuse that will be an unacceptable model. Well, that never happens. Sort out every problem, then only I will sort out this. That is absolutely, that cannot be the case. So parallelly, we have to attack on, like we are doing. In the, in the coal sector, a lot of things are happening. Coal India is doing well. Captive coal blocks are doing well. Commercial mining has also started coming in. So definitely import will reduce and there will be some competition in coal. Coal, nothing was happening. Something has started happening. Its effect, its impact will come in maybe two, three, four years. Procurement, we have to attack. I, I, I was looking after task force of Rajasthan for four or five years. We put in you know, exchange people and something like 100 crore a month or we started saving on procurement by only having a strategy to procure, depending on PPA long back, but also doing procurement at right time, not dispatching something from the PPA without losing. 
and then dispatching something from the market. So those things will, will start happening. We should put, put pressure on them. The second point is that don't definitely look at a structural change for the whole state. Look at the things where we can do something. And therefore, the point that I made also secretary made, secretary, I had a discussion earlier. So therefore, listing the in fact, we should go to the extent of creating some bright spots even within a state control, listing some of the companies which are town based but also rural area, but more of the load is about 60, 74 percent maybe town based. List these companies, make various companies, list these companies as a state controlled companies so that it does not become a discussion of ideology, whether private sector or public sector. I often now say that. When we had to open up generation, we did not have to privatize NTPC. When we had to open up transmission, we didn't have to privatize power grid. We, when we opened up airlines, we didn't privatize Air India at that time, and so on and so forth. So therefore, many times this reform of distribution company in terms of institutional reform, all reforms are reforms, like smart metering is also reform, capex is also reform, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But institutional reform of distribution company is overdue. The spirit of Act has not been followed. Open access has totally been defeated by load dispatch centers, state governments, and regulatory commissions. So, therefore, I think with the states, power ministry could have separate discussion rather than global discussion, means national discussion. Each state will have its own issues and challenges, and in each state will have possibilities and opportunities. So, regulatory commissions would also be informally associated. Uh, distribution company, generation companies, and the state energy departments, plus the power ministry. And for each state, we should work out a solution. And that solution, A, will not say that we are privatizing whole distribution, out of question. That will say, do we have some silver lining where we can do the sort of listing? C, do we have some areas where improvement is required in distribution? irrespective of other problems that exist and therefore do the strategic investment where 51 percent is taken by some process of bidding etc then franchises then parallel licenses i think we can we can have a project management mode of action don't bring in those discussions and don't allow those discussions to be overpowered by regulator is not doing this coal people are not doing this ministry of power is not doing this. they should have their own actions and that is the way we should, we should move. Today's discussion, many things have come. I think Ajay Shankar made a good set of points. I think Mr. Burma has something, some, said something about regulatory assets. Rakesh Nath bring up, bring, uh, brought out the issue of increasing okay. cost. Obviously, if you don't have all coal and you want power 250 gigawatt and we have to import, use imported coal, your procurement strategy of imported coal will have to be different. But those are the issues when we can discuss with them. I think we have had a number of discussions in the past. I we still have discussions. And I always feel that, and I often quote these discussions as derailers of the main line. Main line, we should not lose sight in that discussion to work out a uh, time bound action program. Ministry of Power, the way I got an impression in a brief discussion with uh, Secretary Power. They are well directed on at this point of time what institutional changes we can make. Now, that is not to say that other issues will be forgotten. I think Rakesh Nath is there. Let us have a regulated discussion on what are their views on distribution sector reform. And we will, in that discussion, also bring out a presentation that was, what is it that regulators need to do and if they need a change in policy. So that, that can be another thing. Coal is not, coal is also with us so far, India Energy Forum is concerned. But I think that is the way we should move. And the set of recommendations that we will make, there is a presentation that Mackenzie also made. It is a very excellent presentation, but then it gets uh, overloaded by so many considerations that all of us, we are human beings, start sympathetic with distribution companies. We need to be sympathetic with distribution companies. I know now that Private sector also runs distribution and generation. So therefore, definitely one arm is thinking of something, another arm is thinking of something else. But distribution in general is in a bad shape and consumers are suffering. 
is not to say that Tata that do very well in Delhi or Adani that do very well in Mumbai, but in general they are they are suffering. Alok obviously has run the industry as energy secretary of the state. Alok uh, always will have in mind. I also run distribution company. I will have in mind some weaknesses. So therefore, these weaknesses will continue to be there. No distribution company can become perfect. No generation company can become perfect. But when I want to have interventions to improve one set of organization, I will focus on what are the weaknesses of that organization, which can be internally handled with government. Then what are the weaknesses where they need to be supported from outside interventions? I think yeah, on these lines, we will try to do something, a follow-up discussion from regulators. So we follow up discussion with Puel and also with government. Uh, secretaries did ask that uh, we can we can create a set of uh, conclusions and recommendations and definitely he will give a due consideration to this. So with that, I thank you very much. It has been a very good participation, a quality discussion, numberless, but participation has been very high level. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Shai, sir. You, in fact, covered points covered by all speakers. And uh, now it's my privilege to extend uh, heartfelt gratitude on behalf of India Energy Forum to all esteemed speakers, guests, participants for very, very active engagements and coming out with their thoughts. We'll compile all these uh, observations and submit to President Sir for further submissions to Ministry of Power. A special thanks to Anil Sardana Sir, our Chairman of TND India Energy Forums for guiding us for this webinar. Uh, Shahi Sir and entire IEF machinery for supporting us for this webinar. Thank you everyone and we will close this webinar now. Thank you. Thank you.